The year was 1814, and the most famous ornithologist in American history was surveying the bluffs of the upper Mississippi River, near the Great Lakes, when he came across a bird that was the most impressive he had ever seen. John James Audubon was on a mission. He was putting together a book that contained all the birds of the United States. As he traveled around the country, he collected specimens, wrote detailed descriptions of what he saw, and then painted each bird in meticulous detail. On occasion, he came across species that had not yet been described. In fact, over his years of research, he personally described 25 new species of bird and 12 new subspecies. But on this day, he was going to encounter another new bird that would turn out to be the largest species of eagle in the world. This is the story of the discovery of the Washington Sea Eagle and the controversy that ensued, throwing its existence into dispute, confusion, and ultimately rejection. But did this giant bird actually exist? Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you like this kind of content, then please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or even subscribing to the channel. I really appreciate your support. Audubon was suffering from a cold as he traveled along the upper Mississippi in the dead of winter. He was accompanied by an intelligent Canadian fur trader who was familiar with the birds of the Great Lakes. Audubon was observing ducks and swans, but growing bored of seeing the same species over and over again, when all of a sudden, a giant eagle flew overhead. The bird was huge, and unlike any other eagle Audubon had seen before. He wrote that he would never forget the feeling of delight he felt when he first saw it, describing it as a rapturous event. And the Canadian man he traveled with, who he referred to as his patroon, was also extremely delighted. In his work, Birds of America, Volume 1, Audubon describes the experience like this. An eagle flew over us. How fortunate, the patroon exclaimed. This is what I could have wished. Look, sir, the great eagle, and the only one I have seen since I left the lakes. I was instantly on my feet, and having observed it attentively, concluded, as I lost it in the distance, that it was a species quite new to me. My patroon assured me that such birds were indeed rare, that they sometimes followed the hunters to feed on the entrails of animals which they had killed when the lakes were frozen over, but that when the lakes were open, they would dive in the daytime after fish and snatch them up in the manner of the fishing hawk and that they roosted generally on the shelves of the rocks, where they built their nests, of which he had discovered several by the quantity of white dung scattered below. Audubon's curiosity for the species was awakened, and now he was waiting for a chance to see it again. According to Audubon, his next opportunity to see the bird came a few years later. This time, Audubon was much further south, along the Green River in Kentucky, close to where it connects to the Ohio River. He was there collecting crayfish with some local guides. Along some parts of the Green River are some stony bluffs that rise high above the ground. Audubon noticed that up in the bluffs was a large white patch, which he assumed to be from the excrement of some nesting owls. He spoke with his companions about it, mentioning his theory that the birds nesting there were most likely owls. But one of his guides, who lived just over a mile away, disagreed. He told Audubon that he had personally seen the birds that were keeping chicks in that nest, and that they were actually immature bald eagles, which were still in their brown phase. Audubon writes, I assured him this could not be, and remarked that neither the old nor the young birds of that species 
ever build in such places, but always in trees. Although he could not answer my objection, he stoutly maintained that a brown eagle of some kind, above the usual size, had built there, and added that he had espied the nest some days before and had seen one of the old birds dive and catch a fish. He said that if I felt particularly anxious to know what nest it was, I might soon satisfy myself, as the old birds would come and feed their young with fish, for he had seen them do so before. And so the group of men set off to the base of the bluff to solve the matter. They sat down about 100 yards from where the nest was and tried to remain hidden. Audubon anticipated that the adult birds would be along shortly, but he was wrong, and the group ended up waiting for nearly two hours. Audubon's anticipation and curiosity continued to grow as time ticked slowly on. He was becoming more and more certain that the adult birds that would return were the same species as the giant eagle that he had seen years before at the Great Lakes. Suddenly, the chicks in the nest began to make a hissing noise, indicating that they had sighted their parents. They crawled to the edge of the hole they were in, ready to receive a meal. Audubon and his companions watched in wonder as a huge brown eagle carrying a fish flew in and perched on the edge of the rock. Tail and wings spread, almost like a giant barn swallow. It fed its waiting chicks, while Audubon and his group watched in silence, hoping that they would go unnoticed. After observing the eagle for a few minutes, an even larger eagle came flying in, also with a fish. This, Audubon assumed, must be the female, as eagles often show sexual dimorphism, in which females are about a third larger than the males. But the female wasn't as oblivious as her partner. Audubon would later jokingly write, This watchful solicitude I have ever found peculiar to the female. Must I be understood to speak only of birds? As she landed, she glanced around and immediately spotted Audubon and his party. She dropped her fish, let out a loud screech to warn her partner, and then did something quite strange. Audubon says that the pair of birds hovered over their heads, giving out a growling cry of intimidation before eventually flying away. The chicks hid themselves again, and the scene fell silent. Audubon made the decision right then that the only way to properly observe the birds would be to return the next morning and shoot them all, adults and chicks alike. But apparently, Mother Nature had other plans. Audubon writes, Rainy and tempestuous weather setting in, it became necessary to defer the expedition till the third day following, when, with guns and men all in readiness, we reached the rock. Some posted themselves at the foot, others upon it, but in vain. We passed the entire day without either seeing or hearing an eagle, the sagacious birds no doubt having anticipated an invasion and removed their young to new quarters. Their chance at obtaining a specimen seemed to have passed, and Audubon would go a further two years before he would get a chance to see the species again. After the sighting at the nest, Audubon went on countless excursions hoping to run into this giant eagle again. He claimed to have an arduous desire to capture one of these birds so it could finally be properly described. On this particular day in northwestern Kentucky, Audubon had been visiting the village of Henderson. After finishing there, he began the three-mile journey to the house of his friend, Dr. James Rankin. About a mile from reaching his destination, he noticed something in the distance. I saw an eagle rise from a small enclosure not a hundred yards before me, where the doctor had a few days before slaughtered some hogs, and alight upon a low tree branching over the road. I prepared my double-barreled piece, which I constantly carry, and went slowly and cautiously towards him. Quite fearlessly, he awaited my approach, looking upon me with undaunted eye. I fired, and he fell. 
Before I reached him, he was dead. With what delight did I survey the magnificent bird? Had the finest salmon ever pleased him as he did me? Never. Audubon, no doubt, with a rush of adrenaline and a racing heart, collected his prize and rushed on to the doctor's house. Dr. Rankin was a big supporter of Audubon's work, and he was fascinated by the giant eagle Audubon produced. I ran and presented him to my friend, with a pride which they alone can feel, who, like me, have devoted themselves from their earliest childhood to such pursuits, and who have derived from them their first pleasures. To others, I might seem to prattle out of fashion. The doctor, who was an experienced hunter, examined the bird with much satisfaction, and frankly acknowledged he had never before seen or heard of it. With this, Audubon was finally able to make detailed measurements of the bird. He discovered that it was a male, meaning the smaller of the two sexes. Nonetheless, every measurement he made, from wingspan to height, beak size to talon length, was enormous, larger than either of the other two North American eagles, the bald eagle and the golden eagle. Audubon only records the eagles being seen on two more occasions. In the January after he shot the male eagle in Kentucky, Audubon was visiting the falls of the Ohio. As he was observing the falls, he noticed a pair of the sea eagles flying over them, one pursuing the other. He also made note that they seemed to like to perch in a nearby tree. The very next day, he saw the pair again. This time, Audubon felt that the female was relaxing a little and allowed him to come closer without being scared away. Over several days, Audubon tried pursuing them, but he never managed to get very close. After several days of trying to approach, the eagles moved on, apparently annoyed by his constant presence. His final sighting of the species was on November 15, 1821. This time, Audubon was near the mouth of the Ohio River, when a pair of what he believed to be the giant sea eagles flew gently by, heading downriver. Audubon also claimed to receive a letter from a relative named Mr. W. Bakewell in 1819, in which the man also claimed to see the bird fly over while he was fishing at the falls of the Ohio. Bakewell expressed a desire to see Audubon's drawing of the bird, to confirm that it was the same one that he saw. Audubon was able to produce this plate of the species. The bird has had many names, including Washington's Eagle, Washington's Sea Eagle, Washington Eagle, and the Great Sea Eagle. Audubon chose to include George Washington's name out of a sense of pride for being American and respect for a man who he viewed as a hero of freedom. The name which I have chosen for this new species of eagle, the Bird of Washington, may by some be considered as preposterous and unfit, but as it is indisputably the noblest bird of its genus that has yet been discovered in the United States, I trust I shall be allowed to honor it with the name of one yet nobler, who was the savior of his country and whose name will ever be dear to it. Today, there are few descriptions of the eagle from which to know exactly what it looked like. Audubon published several detailed descriptions, including precise measurements. But the species was only ever depicted twice. One depiction was the plate made by Audubon for his book. The other was a woodcut made for an article for the Magazine of Natural History in 1828. Any other painting of the bird was derivative of these two works. Despite having collected a specimen, none is known to exist in museum collections today, so all we really have to go on is the painting and the descriptions that Audubon made. The eagle was said to stand 3 feet 7 inches tall and have a wingspan of 10 feet 2 inches. For comparison, male bald eagles have an average wingspan of 6 feet 7 inches, while male golden eagles are only around six feet. 
Overall, he describes the bird as being a combination of brown, black, cinnamon, and gray. Audubon also wrote detailed descriptions of each type of feather, the beak, the feet, the talons, and even certain aspects of its gut as he clearly dissected the specimen he had collected. In terms of behavior, it was also unique. The birds made ground nests on cliffs, which is one of the main reasons Audubon knew that it was different from other known species. He also noted differences in the way the bird flew, hunted, and in its temperament. But the main thing that made the species stand out was its enormous size. But it was the size of the bird, combined with its apparent rarity, that would cause many to soon doubt that the Washington Sea Eagle ever existed at all. While in the 1820s it was initially accepted within the ornithological community as a unique species, by the 1830s, some ornithologists were starting to question its legitimacy. The first issue with the bird was the combination of its size and rarity. If the bird was as huge as Audubon said it was, why weren't other people coming forward regularly with sightings of a giant bird? Of course, Audubon would retort that it was incredibly rare, but still, he spotted the species on at least five occasions in his life. Why was it that no other ornithologists were spotting them? The second issue was with Audubon himself. Not only was he famous and therefore immediately attracted negative attention from other jealous scientists in his field, but he was also known to be self-aggrandizing, often exaggerating his stories and experiences for the sake of making himself and his articles and books seem far more interesting. There are verified cases in which he falsified scientific information, and he was also known to prank rival scientists by creating fake species and watching them publish them to their own embarrassment. In 2006, biologist, author, and teacher Scott Maruna published an article in the Ohio Cardinal titled Substantiating Audubon's Washington Eagle. In it, he mentions two specific circumstances in which Audubon was accused of exaggerating for the sake of sensationalizing. In his illustration of mockingbirds, he shows them defending their nest from a rattlesnake. The rattlesnake has climbed a tree in order to get at the nest. Audubon's critics claimed that this showed his affinity for exaggeration, as rattlesnakes do not climb trees. In another illustration, this time of water lilies, he included a yellow species from Florida that he called Nymphia lutea. Botanists accused him of inventing the species as no such water lily was known from North America. The third issue was that the eagle depicted was just a brown eagle. It was theorized that Audubon had misidentified either a golden eagle or an immature bald eagle. Bald eagles undergo a series of brown color morphs in the years leading up to their sexual maturity, making them appear as distinct species. Furthermore, the northern subspecies of bald eagle is also known to be quite a bit larger than the southern subspecies. Perhaps what he had actually come across was just the larger northern bald eagle. The fourth and final controversy was the plate itself. Audubon had a very distinct way of painting his birds. He often placed them among plants that were important to the species, or in a natural or lively pose. But his sea eagle is quite different. While we see it perched on some rocks with a sailboat in the background, it has no movement, no prey, no plants. None of the typical Audubon touches from all of his other plates. Critics will say that this is because the drawing is directly plagiarized. In 1806, Reese's Cyclopedia was published, and in it is this plate of a series of birds of prey and scavengers. In the top right corner is a depiction of a golden eagle with a shocking similarity to Audubon's bird of Washington. The head, wings, tail, and feet are all similarly positioned. 
With all these factors added together over time, the majority of the scientific community rejected the species. By 1870, it was said that only amateur ornithologists still believed it actually existed. This narrative stuck, and a general consensus was reached that Audubon had either deliberately fabricated the Washington Sea Eagle, or that he had misidentified a brown form of the northern bald eagle. But could they all be wrong? In his article, Scott Maruna puts forward a very compelling case in favor of the eagle actually having existed. Maruna is of the opinion that the scientific community was too quick to dismiss Washington Sea Eagle as legitimate, mostly because of scientific bullying following Audubon's death. While we also have the issue of having no fossil, subfossil, or even recent remains, it stands to reason that if the eagle was always rare, physical evidence would be extremely rare as well. Audubon never gave into pressure throughout his life, insisting that his measurements and depiction of the species were true to what he collected. He was publicly criticized, had articles written destroying his character, and eventually had the majority of the scientific community reject the species entirely. But he simply responded with, To have enemies is no uncommon thing. So, how do we defend this species against the main criticisms that have been brought against it? Let's start with the notion that because of its size, more people should have seen it than just Audubon. The thing is, more people did see it. Audubon names specific witnesses in three of his sightings. The Canadian patroon, the men collecting crayfish with him, and Dr. James Rankin. He also mentioned the letter he received from his relative, Mr. W. Bakewell. But they weren't the only ones. In 1838, Jared P. Kirtland cast doubt on Audubon's giant eagle when he wrote, If it be a true species, in his work on the birds of Ohio. But four years later, he himself recorded a sighting of the species on Cleveland Beach on the shore of Lake Erie. And there were many more. Also in 1838, Edward Harris told Audubon that he saw one. Dr. Lemuel Hayward in Boston not only saw one, but apparently kept one for a considerable amount of time. When it died, it was donated to the Linnaean Museum in London. Ornithologist Thomas Nuttall claimed to examine two different specimens of the eagle, one in the New England Museum and a male in a small museum in Philadelphia. The male was reportedly the exact same size as Audubon's, though it weighed slightly more. Audubon heard that the Brano Museum had a specimen, and he went to examine it himself. He concluded that it was the same species, and then he tried to buy it, but he couldn't afford the price the museum was asking for it. Sometime later, Richard Harlan, the respected author of Fauna Americana, managed to purchase the specimen. He later donated it to the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia, but the specimen has since disappeared. In the 19th century catalogues of both the New England Museum and the Cleveland Academy of Science, they list having Washington eagles in their collections, though these specimens have also seemingly disappeared. Maruna also found evidence that several zoos and private collectors kept living Washington sea eagles in their collections in the 19th century. So while the bird was clearly extremely rare, it wasn't only Audubon who saw it or recorded it. Next is the criticism that Audubon was a known liar and liked to self-aggrandize. While it is true that Audubon occasionally got himself into trouble for overstating reality to impress his readers, he was never known to go so far as to create a new species, publish it, and then insist for decades that it was real, just for the clout. He did describe a few other birds that are today disputed, 
but they aren't particularly impressive. And oftentimes, the things he was accused of making up turned out to be true. Audubon spent far more time in the field than many other scientists of his day. He witnessed things that others hadn't, simply because he was always out in nature. For example, it has been shown that while not commonly observed, rattlesnakes do climb trees. One study in eastern Texas found that it wasn't uncommon and that the snakes could go as much as 50 feet up a tree in search of prey. As for the water lily that Audubon was accused of inventing, in 1876, 25 years after his death, it was rediscovered, still surviving in the Everglades, proving once again that Audubon was more often than not telling the truth. So, was he as worthy of distrust as his contemporaries claimed he was? He is still considered to be one of the greatest contributors to the field of ornithology in North America, showing that in general, he's considered a trustworthy source of scientific information. Perhaps the strongest argument against the Washington Sea Eagle being a recognized species is that it was actually a misidentified northern bald eagle in an immature phase. In fact, many of the sources I read about the species continue to push the belief that this is the true identity of Washington Sea Eagle. If this is the case, we would need to agree that Audubon lied about all of his measurements that he made on the male bird he shot. It's argued that in his excitement on finally capturing the bird, he didn't just make a mistake on one or two of his measurements, but that he deliberately exaggerated all of them. But the bird had a named witness, Dr. Rankin. If the bird was just the size of a bald eagle, wouldn't he have come forward and said something? And Audubon wasn't the only one to measure the eagle. Thomas Nuttall confirmed the size of the bird when he measured the specimen that he is said to have had. And it's likely that the other museums that had specimens also performed measurements on them. If we look at the measurements put forward by Audubon, next to measurements of adult bald eagles and immature bald eagles, we can clearly see that the Washington Sea Eagle far surpasses the others. Maruna also created a graph comparing the coloration of the Washington Sea Eagle to each of the color morphs of the bald eagle, and found that the two didn't match at any stage of bald eagle development. Maruna notes that Audubon's descriptions of the beak and the scaling on the legs are also entirely distinct from those of bald eagles. But it wasn't just the physical description that doesn't seem to fit. The story of the nesting eagles is perhaps the most interesting. For one, the birds were in a wooded area, but chose to nest on a stone cliff. While bald eagles have been documented nesting on rock faces, they only do so in the absence of trees. Bald eagles will always choose to nest in trees when possible. Also, the birds Audubon and his company saw nesting were both brown. This would mean that if they were bald eagles, they were still immature. Immature bald eagles are known to occasionally start nesting around their fourth year, but by this point, their coloration would practically be that of a fully mature adult making them impossible to confuse with any other species. Not only that, Audubon had witnessed countless bald eagles and golden eagles in his years in the field. They're well documented in his articles and his journals. So the idea that Audubon would have seen two fully brown, immature bald eagles nesting and then misidentified them doesn't seem likely. The final argument against Audubon is the painting of the Washington Sea Eagle, which appears to be plagiarized. This one is hard to deny. It's plain to see that the Washington Sea Eagle was painted in almost the exact same way as the Golden Eagle found in Rhesus Cyclopedia. But here it's important to note that the criticism of art and the criticism of science are two different things. While Audubon may have plagiarized the painting, 
this does not automatically lead us to the conclusion that everything about the bird is a lie. Perhaps in an effort to portray a familiar sense of American pride and establish the bird as a national image, Audubon chose to pose the bird in a position that was already familiar to the American public. It's hard to say, but it's likely that Audubon didn't paint this plate from the specimen that he shot as he originally claimed to have done. So we have three options to explain the existence of this bird. The first is the most widely accepted, that the Washington Sea Eagle was actually a misidentified northern bald eagle with immature coloration. For me, this doesn't seem likely. It assumes that Audubon was seeking to tell the truth, but time after time made the mistake of misidentification. He was extremely familiar with bald eagles, and his numerous encounters with the Washington Sea Eagle, including physical contact with dead specimens, would mean that he would have had to have made a series of grave mistakes in identification, which is difficult to believe. The second theory is that the Washington Sea Eagle actually existed, though it was already very rare by the time it was recorded. Soon after being documented, it would have been driven to extinction in the last remaining pocket of its range, somewhere around the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. But how do we explain the lack of physical evidence of the bird? Where did all the museum specimens go? Why aren't there any fossilized remains of the species? The third theory is that Audubon knowingly invented the bird and used it to advance his career. In his journal article titled Audubon's Bird of Washington, Unraveling the Fraud that Launched the Birds of America, published in the Bulletin of the British Ornithologist Club in 2020, Matthew R. Halley pieces together an argument that Audubon needed something impressive to capture the imagination of Europeans in order to get them to fund his expedition. In the abstract to his journal, he writes, The preponderance of evidence suggests that the bird of Washington was an elaborate lie that Audubon concocted to convince members of the English nobility who were sympathetic to American affairs to subscribe to and promote his work. Audubon rode his bird of Washington to widespread fame and then actively maintained the ruse for more than 20 years until his death, fueling decades of confusion among scientists and the general public. Indeed, it was this specific species that launched him to celebrity status and brought on the majority of his early patrons in Europe, allowing him to continue his work documenting the birds of America. Whatever the case, the mystery of the Washington Sea Eagle endures. Sightings of giant birds exist from across the continent, and the Native American folklore of the giant Thunderbird which was said to be capable of carrying away buffaloes and humans, adds another layer to the possible existence of this giant bird in North America. It's also possible that sitting deep in the collections of a museum in the USA or in Europe lies a larger than normal brown eagle with a 10 foot wingspan, just waiting for someone to stumble upon it again. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. I need to say a special thanks to my patrons. Without their ongoing support, I wouldn't be able to produce a video like this every week. If you want to join us on Patreon, click the link in the video description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.